Tonight marks a very historical 
to act in addition to Krishna's advent into this world. Exactly 40 years ago, to the Prabhupada, was on the cargo ship Jamadunta in the Arabian Sea. The only Vaishnava on the whole boat. All alone. As the boat was going along the Arabian Sea, old cargo ship. On Friday the 13th of August 1965, she was on the board of the Java He was already getting some sickness, so many Two days later, he wrote, how he was feeling such deep separation from Vrindavan down at his home. Yes, on that John Mastery, all of his god brothers, god sisters, and all of the devotees in the world. We're celebrating Janmashtami in temples with kirtans and feasts and lectures and beautiful assemblies. He was alone on that old car bush. And he did it all just to make it possible for us to have these festivals together with thousands of associates all over the world. Let us begin by, on this 40th anniversary of Prabhupada's Java Dutta Chai Master. Let us bow our heads in that. a great sacrifice of compassion we made to make this not possible for all of us. In the Bhagavad Gita, fourth chapter, Krishna tells, Janma karma chale devyam evam no vedita, yakva deham punar janma naiti na One who understands the transcendental, the divya, the spiritual nature of my appearance and activities in this world, never takes birth again, never suffers again, but attains my eternal life. And Srila Prabhupada explains according to the scriptures and the great self-realized saints that the absolute truth, Krishna, is not different from the name, the pastimes, the teaching. Anything that is directly connected with Krishna is not different than Krishna. And when we are hearing about Krishna from the proper sources, we are, in fact, directly associating with Krishna. Om Apavitra Apavitra Va Sarvada Samgatopiva Yasmare Kundarikaksham Sapaya Vyantara Suchi. Whether we are pure or impure, or even having passed through all situations, when we remember Krishna, we become purified both within and without. 
if Krishna comes to this world once in a day of Brahma, that's several billion years, in his original transcendental form from the spiritual world, to perform such beautiful, all attractive pastimes to attract our hearts. Out of compassion, the Lord descends into this world. Because the conditioned soul's nature is to be so engrossed in superficial thoughts and attachments. It's the body, which is like the set of clothing that covers the soul, the eternal self, is always changing, subjected to time. We become so engrossed in these things and relationships based on these things that we forget the true essence of who we are and what we really want. Somebody once wrote, you can never get enough of what you don't really want. We are the soul. We don't really want all these things. Profit, adoration, distinction, money, sensual pleasures. It comes and it goes. But Krishna is so kind. In so many ways, in so many times, in so many forms, he comes through this world just to attract our consciousness back into his eternal loving service. The true happiness of the heart. Lord Chaitanya prayed, Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Satya Kapuroi Saravan Adi Sudhi Chitri Kodi Gezutra. That love for God is within the heart of every living being. By hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord and the association of like-minded people, that love of God is awakened. And the Prabhupada often said that Krishna in the Gita tells Paritra Naya Sadhinam Vinashaya Dharma Samstapa Naradaya Sambhavami that in order to annihilate the miscreants, to protect the devotees and re-establish religious principles, I descend into this world again and again. But our Guru Maharaj explains, Krishna can do that through so many different expansions, incarnations, through his devotees, through material nature. The essential reason the Lord descends is out of pure compassion for all beings to speak words and perform activities that charm, enchant, and attract our hearts back to our own original love. Because Krishna is all attractive. Shukadeva Goswami describes in Srimad Bhagavatam how <clears throat> at the end of the Dwapar Yuga, this was approximately 5,000 years ago, the earth planet was being trampled on by greedy, egoistic, demoniac people who were exploiting resources in such a way that the majority of the population was suffering terribly. And Mother Earth is the mother of all beings within our planet. She was broken hearted to see this. And she took the form of a cow and approached Lord Brahma. Weeping tears to 
see how her children was being, were being abused and misused. And how the resources that she was providing for everyone's well-being were being used for an opposite purpose. For destruction and greed. And she pleaded her case from her heart. Then Lord Brahma, along with Lord, along with Lord Shiva and the other great devas, they all went to the planet called Svetadvip, where there is an ocean of milk. And they stood in the ocean of milk and they chanted prayers called Purusha Shukra to attract the Lord's compassion. But nothing happened. At least it didn't appear so. At that time, Brahmaji, he said in meditation, fixed in compassion upon all of his children within this world. And the Lord, Vishnu, Krishna, spoke within his heart, Tele Brahma Vidaya Adhikali. Brahma came out of his meditation and spoke to the Devatas and the great Rishis. He said, I have just heard the voice of God. He has given me this message that he will soon appear within this world and relieve all of your anguish. He will come in his original form, the Supreme Personality of God, and descending from the spiritual world as Krishna in the Yadu dynasty. So all of you should take birth within the Yadu dynasty to assist him in his mission. Brahma went back home to Brahma Loka and to start taking birth in the Yadu dynasty. Meanwhile, Sukadev Goswami says, in the province of Surasena was a king named Surasena, and his son was Vasudev. In Mathura area, Vasudev was marrying the daughter of Devaka, whose name was Devaki. It was a wonderful royal marriage. And afterward, Devaki was going to go back to her husband's house with him on the night of their marriage. And her cousin brother, Kamsa, he was so affectionate to his sister that he volunteered, although he was a grand, powerful prince. He said, let me drive your chariot home, just to be an expression of my love for you. So they were going through the night. Kamsa was taking the reins of the chariot, and it was a very affectionate reciprocation they were all sharing together on that chariot until a loud voice thundered in the sky. Kamsa, you are a fool. You are taking some nice care of your sister, but you do not know the eighth child of Devaki will kill you. And there was silence. Kamsa was so afraid. Immediately, with his powerful hand, he grasped onto Devaki's hair, pulled her toward him, and with his other hand he drew his sword, was about to sever her head. Vasudev 
had to do something to save his beloved newly the wed wife. And he began to speak to Kasa. I wish we had more time. He spoke really nice philosophy. In essence, he said to Kamsa that the physical body is going to die inevitably. And the Atma, the soul, the true self who is animating this body is eternal, can never be destroyed. So no one should ever do anything immoral and pollute their whole future destiny and ruin their name just to protect oneself from the inevitable. He gave nice examples of when a traveler is walking, very practical. You put one step down, but then in order to go any further, you have to take another step off the ground. And then you put it forward. Then you have to take another step off the ground. In the same way, the soul, from body to body to body, according to our activities, we should live morally, we should live spiritually, so that there's integrity in our life. And then when the inevitable does, does come, we have a glorious future. But Kamsa could not hear him. He was in no mood of philosophy. He was scared for his life. And he was angry. What was at one moment love and affection for his sister now became fear and hatred. Also, they've tried so many different philosophical points. Finally, he was thinking, I have to say something to protect my sister. I mean, my wife. And he said to Gamsa, you have no danger from Devaki. It's her eighth child. Leave Devaki alone and I give you my word. Every child that we ever have, I will offer to you and you can do anything you want. Vasudev was such a man of honor. Kamsa knew he would never tell a lie at any cost. And he said, all right, you go home with David. I have no danger for her. Sometime later, they had a first child. And Vasudev brought that little baby to Kamsa. The council is really surprised. You're actually willing to have your child slain by me? You're so honest to keep your word? His heart softened. He said, I have no danger from this child. It's the eighth child I'm worried about. Take your child home, go home with Devaki, and enjoy. Vasudev left. Relieved, but he knew that Kamsa could not be trusted because he had no control of his mind or senses, his ego. Then Narada Muni appeared. He came to the outskirts of Mathura and sent a messenger to Kamsa. Kamsa knew. If you honor a holy man, you get more power. So he came out and offered sweet words, offered gifts, a nice sitting place to Narada. Then Narada spoke. He said, recently I was traveling around the universe and I came upon a meeting. Rama was meeting with the devas, your bitter enemies. And they were plotting a conspiracy to kill you and your entire dynasty. 
In fact, I was told, I overheard from them that the demigods, your enemies, are all taking birth in the Yadu dynasty. And not only that, Vishnu could come at any time and ask any of the children of Devaki. And let me tell you one more thing. In your last life, your name was Kalanami, and Vishnu killed you. And he's coming back to kill you again. Just thought you should know these things. <laughs> and then Maharaj left. Kamsa became so concerned, so disturbed, that he immediately arrested Devaki, Vasudev, put them in prison with iron shackles around their arms and legs. Then he arrested his own father, Ugrasena, the king, and took his throne. And then he began to terrorize all the leaders of the Yadin and Dhaka Surasen dynasties. And practically all the leaders of these different kingdoms, they fled like refugees. They went to other lands in a hiding. And a few of them, like Kapura, stayed on and served Kamsa just so that he could see Krishna get born. Now someone may ask, why did Narada Muni do this? He wanted to accelerate Krishna's he also wanted to accelerate Kamsa's disappearance. <laughs> and he also had a very secret mission, which I'll tell you about. Devaki and Vasudev had one child after another. Six. And each one of them, Kamsa, would take by the legs and smash against the rock to the Now, it is said that saintly people are paradukaduki. Another person's suffering is their suffering. So why did Narada Muni tell Kamsa this, knowing that he was going to kill all these children? Do you all know the secret? There were six sons of Marichi. They were Davis very enlightened beings from the upper planets. And these six sons, it's a long story, but they were cursed to take birth as demons. Two times. The first time they were the grandchildren of Hiranyakashipu and the sons of Kaladeni. And they went out and performed some yajna to get powers and when Hiranyakashipu found out that they were doing tapasya, yoga, without his permission and consent, he cursed them that their father, Kalanemi, would take the next birth as Kamsa and he would kill them. Now these six, they're called the Satgarbas. They didn't want demon bodies. They didn't want to be born in demon dynasties. They wanted to go as soon as possible back to their abodes. So they wanted Narada Muni to come and have Kamsa kill them right from birth, and they could just go back to their abodes. So Narada, whatever he was doing, was for the ultimate benefit of what everyone wanted. And it was then Balaram, Ananta Dev, appeared in Devaki's womb. And Devaki became extremely beautiful because he's the first expansion of Krishna. But when Kamsa saw that, he was very alert to wait for that child to be born. 
At this time, Krishna approached Yogamaya, his internal spiritual potency, and told her, transfer Balaram from Devaki's womb into his original mother, Rohini's womb. Rohini was then Vasudev's wife, but she was she was pregnant from Vasudev, and when Vasudev saw she was pregnant, he sent her to his best friend Nanda Maharaj in Mahavan Gokul at Vrindavan. He told Yogamaya, bring her and transfer her to the womb of Rohini. And then I will immediately enter into Devaki's womb, and you should become the daughter of Yashoramaya. Srila Prabhupada quotes the Harivamsa, which explains how Rohini was pregnant. In the seventh month of her pregnancy, she had a dream at midnight. Actually, it says it was as if it was a dream. She had a miscarriage. The dream was so disturbing, she woke up and she realized that she actually did. She was very disturbed. Then Yoga Maya spoke to her and said that I am attracting the child from the womb of Devaki into your womb. And he is Balaram Ananda. His name will be Shankar Shah because he's uniting the two families. So he this with Lord Balaram. And Krishna appeared in the womb of Devi. Actually, the Bhagavatam explains how he took birth. First, Krishna descended from the spiritual world and entered into the heart, the mind of Vasudeva. Vasudeva became filled with bliss and he became effulgent. Then he was transferred from the heart of Vasudev to the heart of Devaki. And how that was done? It is explained just as when the full moon rises in the eastern horizon, the sun rays are transferred from the sun to the moon. In the same way, Krishna entered Devaki's heart not by any ordinary methods of having children, but through this divine process. From the heart of Devaki, the child entered into her mind. Then she was so beautiful, so effulgent, the whole prison cell started to look like Vaikunita and Kamsa. When he saw this, he knew for sure this is the eighth child. All around the seventh child, they thought it was a miscarriage. Now it's the eighth child. This is surely Vishnu who has come to kill me. Kamsa was waiting for the moment for that child to be born. When he was eating, when he was sleeping, when he was walking, when he was working, anything he did, 24 hours a day, he was engrossed in fear of Vishnu. Vishnu the Prabhupada explains, he was really absorbed, but it's not Krishna consciousness. <laughs> Because it was unfavorable. The devas, they all invisibly came into the prison cell of Kamsa and offered their beautiful prayers again and again and again, and trying to inspire and enliven Devaki. 
And imagine the heart of David being a mother. Six of her children were killed in front of her eyes. One was a miscarriage. She didn't know where he went. And now she's feeling unlimited, inconceivable love for this child in her womb because he's the supreme object of everyone's love. But at the same time, she's feeling when this child born, what will happen? And it was at this time, all the constellations became very, very auspicious. And the star called Rohini was predominant. Everywhere, all over the world, all of the universe, in fact, people were feeling such peace of mind. It was midnight. Birds were singing. Peacocks were dancing with their peahens. All the rivers and the waterfalls and the oceans were making sweet, beautiful music. And the Brahmins who were being persecuted for so many years by Kamsa, they felt such bliss and satisfaction in their hearts. The whole world turned blissful. And even though it was not a full moon night, the full moon rose in its full effulgence because Krishna was going to appear in the lunar dynasty. So the Lord of the Moon wanted to celebrate by appearing. And it was then at this time at midnight in the prison cell of Kamsa that the Supreme Personality of Godhead appeared in the darkness of the prison cell. He had four arms carrying the kamsha, the, the chakra, the lotus flower, and the club. He had beautiful kostuma mani and a wonderful golden helmet, wonderful yellow clothes, the color of lightning. Seeing the form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vasudev prayed beautiful prayers of love and devotion. And then David, he prayed. Krishna appeared in this way just so David, he would not be afraid that Kamsa could kill him. But still, as a mother, even though she knew he was God, she was afraid. <laughs> Mother's love doesn't is beyond rational, logic, philosophical methods. It's something much deeper than all of that. It's in the heart, especially when it's on a spiritual platform. Well, Devaki prayed that you are the supreme, the absolute, the cause of all causes. Everything that is born in creation is coming from your womb, and yet you are being, you are taking birth from my womb. I'm just an insignificant small little lady. But please don't show this form, because if Kamsa sees you like this, he will know you're his enemy, and I'm worried what he may do to you. Please appear as an ordinary child. And the superiors. Maybe someone else should do the RT. I'm supposed to do the RT, but I can't do the story now. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Krishna, to satisfy Devaki, he spoke. And to relieve you of your suffering and anxiety tonight, Vasudev, you bring me across the river Yamuna and replace me with the child of Nanda and Yashoda. So, yes, it was on this night 
that the Supreme Absolute Truth transformed from the Vishnu form to a little tiny two-handed baby. Gopal. And suddenly by Yoga Maya's potency, everyone in Mathura fell asleep, including the guards. And the doors to the prison opened, and the chains loosened, and Vasudev brought that little baby out. It was pouring rain, and Ananta Shesha came to form an umbrella to protect the child from even being touched by a drop. He came to the river Yamuna, and it was swirling with a very, very powerful current. 